Hey, what is going on, good people? And welcome back to the eternal search for truth. So, we're still trying to wrap this bad boy up in under a hundred episodes, but doing baby length episodes like last episode isn't gonna help. So let's get on down and try and get some advancements in this juicy plot. Okay, Judgy, what's the verdict? Therefore, in accordance with the defense's request, the court will now listen as his music box is set in operation once more. Oh, yo, they look disgusted. This time, with the second disc in place, and both discs playing simultaneously. Ding, 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 ding. Let's do it. Oh, yo. Interesting. Damn. Okay, look at that. It's unmistakable now. It's Morse code. Hold it. All right, all right, I admit it. Whatever you want, but for the love of God, shut that blooming box up. Right, I haven't actually pressed the button yet. Okay, bit of a cutscene there. Guys, if any of you know Morse code, I'm not sure if we will find out the answer this episode, but some of you may actually have the jump on what that stood for. So, yeah, definitely let me know if you know that. Although that's going to be a massive spoiler for me. Yeah, maybe, maybe don't do that, but... Uh... If anyone's got any good guesses, that uh, that might be slightly more acceptable. Let's see. Let me ask you again then, Gregsy. Did you or did you not strike a deal with the witness next to you in the stand? Begs Enedict. Specifically, did you furnish the witness with confidential case details in exchange for this music box disc? Did you reveal the existence of the peephole in the pawnbroker's storeroom door, Inspector? Go on, Gregsy. Oh, did. Yes, he was honest. <gasps> Stop. What are you doing, man? Yo, he's freaking out. It's all exactly like the young Eastern lawyer said. But surely Zeke isn't going to trust any of this. He's going to be like, no, you beat me last time, and now you're saying that was all a lie, and the guy was actually guilty. When the trial resumed after the recess, and we were stood here in the stand together, that's when he approached me with the deal. Shut up, you imbecile! Shut up! Damn. He's losing the rag. Psst, you there. You're the detective who turned up at the pawnbrokery the other day, aren't you? I may have something you're looking for, Inspector, with me at this very moment. So how about a trade I suggest you accept, or info that may make certain individuals uncomfortable will soon become very public indeed. I oh, couldn't let that info become public knowledge. Not under any circumstances. So I accepted the man's proposal and told him details about the case that should have put him in the clear. The people in the storeroom door and the bloodstains on the overcoat. Um... I... Thought. Yeah, that was it. I think the jacket went purple. So it's not actually Windabank's blood. Yeah, so we've still got that loophole we can uh, squeeze out. By giving false testimony, this witness intended to have the defendant wrongly accused of murder. Inspector, you knew that, yet you still revealed those details to facilitate the witness's perjury. Yeah, that's pretty extreme and not cool. Oh, dude. 
But then it turned out the peephole had only been made that night after the incident took place. Yeah, dropped him right in it. Scotland Yard wasn't aware of that, if I'm perfectly honest. Nice, just a one smash. Well, what do you have to say for yourself? He's still not going to talk, is he? Ugh. Ugh. There's nothing and no one left for you to hide behind. Especially not a third fake name. You struck a deal with the inspector in order to escape conviction of a very serious crime. Namely this. You are the third intruder who broke into the pawn brokery on the night in question. And you perpetrated the murder of the proprietor, Mr. Pop Windybank. Oh, yeah, he undid the top button. Uh, you, you. What? Traitor! Whoa, Gregsy, get out of there. You can't do that in court. Uh, what was that? The cane breaking? Or something? Or something flying out of Gregsy's mouth? Did he kill Gregsy? Bailiff! Bailiff! Restrain that man! At once! Well, if he wasn't guilty of that, he'll certainly be thrown in for a while. Just for doing that crap in court. That's it then. It's all over! My God! Could we have done it in under a hundred? Of course, guys, you know it's going to be at least another two episodes of just endgame post-plot chatter. Like, oh yes, very nice, I'll be going to Japan now. Oh, wait, the main character's not a girl, but yeah. Um, come on, what's all the silence? Yo, new tune. I despised my life growing up. Those slums are vile places. I was cursed from birth, born into poverty, the son of a penniless artisan. My parents did nothing but quarrel all day long. What little money they had was never spent on me. Okay, so you leaked government secrets? So I set about studying to better myself, to one day escape from that hellhole. And you eventually became a communications officer. I admire your determination. But then you decided to try to sell government secrets. Why? Man, I have no idea what game we're going to play once this is finished. If you guys have any ideas, try and shout me sooner rather than later. Uh, I have got a few on the list I'm slowly working through, but... Um... Yeah, oh, actually, yeah. yeah. Actually, I think I know exactly what we're going to be doing, so scratch that. But ideas are always welcome, so keep them coming. Isn't it obvious, because I wanted money, even now, years later, the nightmares of my life in the slums wake me in the small hours. I wanted to drown them out with more money than anyone who lived in that squalor could ever imagine. Then one day I met him. Mr. Magnus McGilded. Oh, yo. He did seem well evil. Uh, you're a fiend of queer talent, so you are. I've money to throw your way if you're interested. All you need to do is go along with me little plan now. Okay. From beyond the grave. I was to steal the Ministry's telegraphic message logs and McGilded would buy them for a handsome sum. As I was responsible for inspections of the Ministry's communications office, it was a simple enough task. The lure of the devil's offerings. How easy it is to succumb. But you must surely have realised the seriousness of the crime you were committing. So yeah, guys, I would imagine we don't need the court record ever again. Uh, fun fact, I can't remember if we've actually done it in this game or not, but in the... I'm pretty sure it was the first two Phoenix Wrights. They do a little sort of moral of the story jam, or like there'll be one mystery left unsolved. And then at the end, you'll talk about it just before the chapter fade out. 
and they'll ask you one last time, like, so what do you think, blah, blah, blah? And then depending on what answer you give, it doesn't matter either way, but they'll have, the answer they'll give you is interesting, depending on whether you're right or wrong. Uh, pretty sure I read that. Oops. And for that reason, I took great lengths to ensure that my actions were untraceable. By using the music box. My father was a brick maker, though my mother divorced him when I was still a child. Ah yes, Double M himself. That's right, he was very skilled with his hands. He'd once been a music box maker's apprentice. Ah, that's how he got the gimmick. I imagined his skills would be sufficient to create a machine that could generate Morse code. So I sought out my father again to employ his services. It was the first time I'd seen him since I left the slums ten years earlier. Damn. God knows what voice we gave him. I don't usually bother for these sort of cutscenes, anyway. Look at you, Ashley. What a fine gent you've become, eh? He was a different man to the one in my memory. A thin, frail old man. But poverty had never broken him. Never corrupted him like it had me. I was sure that he wouldn't help me if I told him the real reason. So I made up a story. I've got some work for you, Father. I need some music box discs made. Music box discs, eh? A musician friend of mine has written some music he wants to sell to the public. I've brought the score with me. There are two, actually. I'd be delighted, son. It's been 20 years since I did any work like this, though. Fetch my tools, would you? They're in the loft. That's how I had him make the two discs thereby splitting the information in two. You were taking considerable precautions indeed. Damn, no wonder he was desperate for that disc. It was to protect myself as much as anything. It meant that I could deal with McGilded in two separate transactions. The first involved the first of two discs and the music box for playing them. I exchanged them with him for ten guineas. Then on receipts of the second disc, he would pay a thousand guinea pigs. So, what happened on the Omnibus two months ago? Was the second part of the deal the exchange of the second disc? Yes. I'd sold the man info that way a number of times already, but it seems he became reluctant to part with his money. Well, that doesn't quite make sense. For why was it that on the omnibus two months ago, your father was the one dealing with the gilded and not yourself? Wait, was, why did it auto-save? Nervous! When I received the thousand guinea pigs after my completed dealings with him, I decided to give two hundred of them to my father for his troubles. Sweet delicious gold guinea pigs. Wonder how much they're worth these days. But my, but my father realised something was amiss. In time he worked out that I must be involved in something dubious. And when he did, he said to me, Next time there's an exchange, you'll let your old man do it, understand? Otherwise I won't take your money anymore. I'll throw it into the fire like Van Zeke's. That was my father's way of dealing with it, I suppose. Climb into the omnibus, hand over the second disc and take the money from the gilded. That's it. He had no idea what was actually on the discs I'd asked him to make. He never knew. Just like I'll never know why everything went so horribly wrong that night. Yeah, that was a pretty rough ending. All I know is that the disc was taken from him and he never returned home. Damn. Oh, does he not know what happened? It was only then that I found out what sort of a monster he really was. So after ten years of not once uttering it, I swore on my father's name. I'd kill him. To exact revenge. 
Revenge? As anyone with even the remotest knowledge of the man will no doubt be able to imagine, McGilded brought all his wealth and influence to bear in the most despicable of ways. Oh, yo, he really hated him. To crush any semblance of justice in his trial. <gasps> the crime scene was tampered with, evidence was fixed, and witnesses were bribed. That trial two months ago was a farce from start to finish. My feet had barely touched British soil back then, and I walked into that hornet's nest completely unaware of the sinister background to it all, and beat the Reaper himself with my own bare hands! I'd made plenty of money out of my dealings with him by then, so I spared nothing in my arrangements two months ago. I knew exactly who to hire. If you're willing to pay the price, there are people in this city willing to do anything you ask. Even eat their own head. McGilded himself had shown me that. Uh, are you saying that... I think you have the picture now. After he twisted everything to his favour in this courtroom to ensure that he walked free. I took matters into my own hand. Oh yeah, we never found out who burnt the omnibus. Um, and delivered the justice that monster deserved. Nice! Wrapped up two murders in one case. That tragic accident following the trial here two months ago was planned and executed by yours truly. The Gilded's death that day was caused by this man! Eggs Benedict himself. Everything is ready, sir. If you'd like to follow me to the courtroom, then we'll skip this flashback. Let's go. Yeah. Get it done. Come on, baby. Keep going. Shut up. Shut up. Yeah. We win. So that policeman who came to tell McGill did he could examine the omnibus again. That's right, an imposter hired by me. He used his wealth to manipulate the trial. He paid people to adulterate the omnibus with all manner of false evidence. He threatened witnesses to lie in their testimony. Oh yeah, Gina was shook up, right? So I gave the man a taste of his own medicine. Once the omnibus was doused in paraffin, one of my sham policemen ushered him inside and sent him on a one-way journey to hell. <laughs> God damn, that's brutal. Why is he so openly callous in court? An eye for an eye. That's how I avenged my father's death. That is pretty gruesome. Job well done. A spine-chilling account indeed. But that wasn't the end of it for me. There was a loose end, you see. Ah, the guy who dabbled of the discs in the first place. A loose end. Yes, I should think it's obvious. The second disc which my father had taken to exchange of McGilded. Ah, yes. There was indeed no mention of it in a man's trial two months ago. Clearly because it has been removed from the scene of the crime. When I realised it was missing, I remembered something. Something from the first time I dealt with McGilded. Oh, yo. Heavy on the flashback. Well, technically not a flashback here. It's from memory. Uh, this is the first of two discs and the music box. You need to play them. Well, look at that now. What an ingenious little invention. So then, as promised, ten guineas for you, young man. Wh what's this? Windebank's pawn brokery? Aye, it is a pawnbroker's ticket, so it is. You can use it to redeem an article I've deposited there for you. There's no need to give a name. Just hand over the ticket and tell the fiend the watchword. I put a jewel in pawn for you. It'll fetch ten guineas if you sell it, so it will. I've never heard of a pawn brokery being used in quite that way before. Have you not? London's pawn brokeries are very useful places, you know. Each one is like an extremely secure vault. Hell yeah, you can find some hella good stuff. That has got to suck if you want to buy your stuff back and it's just like, sorry, sold it. Come on, just... 
do the guilty verdict. So I knew that if he'd taken steps to hide the disc, it would be in that pawn brokery somewhere. And on the night he killed my father, he must have entrusted the ticket to someone. Yes, to Gina. I remember now that when we first met you at Winderbanks that afternoon two days ago, you had a description of her written down. Oh yeah, that was weird. How did you know who you were looking for? McGilded, obviously. From the trial, that pickpocket's testimony was clearly peculiar. Anyone could see that. Oh, okay. Was he in the crowd or something? I realised immediately that she was another of his pawns, that he must have threatened her somehow. I was fairly convinced it would be her who had the ticket. So I started to make some inquiries. I had a strong suspicion the girl would come out of the woodwork on the redemption deadline. And he was absolutely right. And yes, sure enough, she did. All I needed to do was wait until the girl went to Winderbanks to redeem the articles. But unfortunately, she redeemed only McGilded's overcoat and the one disc that was in its pocket. The all-important music box with the second disc inside was missing. Because it had already been forfeited two days earlier. But I was unaware of that fact. Had I not been, I could have avoided my nighttime excursion. Meanwhile, as our investigation into the stolen government secrets was progressing, we picked up on the fact that McGilded was involved. Inspector, you've recovered fast. My orders were to recover the stolen info as quickly as possible. So we started gathering this fella's possessions and examining whatever we could lay our hands on. We had a full-scale investigation going on at the yard, but we had to keep it as quiet as we could. Then when the inspector here took the disc from me in the pawn brokery that day, I became nervous. I was sure the music box and the second disc were still there in the shop somewhere, so I knew that it was a race against time. I had to find those articles before the police did. So that's what prompted you to break into the place that same night. With the help of your old friends, the Skalkin Brothers. Amazing. Damn. What happened that night in the pawn brokery, I can only describe as a nightmare. While they were searching the counter, I'd located the music box I'd sold to him on the shelves of forfeited articles. And the second disc was inside? Yes, I slipped it into my pocket with a very deep sigh of relief. But then something entirely unexpected happened. What are you doing in my shop? Death to Winderbank. A gunshot to right oh, us, the wrong voice, in the shop, and I felt a sharp pain in my left arm. Right, it's a bit of a weird one. I think we'll leave it here for today. Um, yeah, we may not finish in under 100 episodes, but it looks like we have officially won this case. So, happy with ending, in, ending it there for today. So, guys, if you like the looks of any of the suggested videos flooding your screen at this very second, check some of them out. And more importantly, let me know what you thought, because truthy feedback is hella good feedback. Of course, if you missed any of the great Ace Attorney Chronicles so far, then catch up because we're nearly finished, honey, and it's been a long journey. But the main thing is, as always, guys, I hope you're well. Thanks for watching and see you again next time.